Hey folks, how's it going? Today we're going to be making this really fun interactive piece of content where we can see this really cool feedback, lots of beautiful colors, and the ability to kind of draw on screen with our mouse. So there's a lot of different creative things we can do with this, but let's go ahead and delete everything and start it from scratch. So the first thing I'm going to do here is create my circle and the canvas that we're going to be using for our interactive kind of drawing tool here. So I'll go ahead and make a circle top. And what I'm going to do is make a constant top that's going to act as my background. So I'll go ahead in the common page of parameters and I'll set my resolution to 1920 by 1080. And then I'll go to the constant page of settings, turn off the alpha and set the color to black. Now, one trick that I really like using in these kind of contexts that's a little bit more optimized than just making the circle top 1080p and moving the circle around is actually compositing that circle and transforming it around in my compositing stage. So what I like to do for this is create something like an overtop and I can take my circle and put it over my background. Now, at first, you're going to see the circle gets stretched and squished in all kinds of ways that we don't want. So what I'll do on my overtop is go to the prefit overlay and change it from fill to native resolution. So now what we're going to do is essentially find some kind of input and use it to control these TX and TY values we have on our overtop. So I want to start just with a simple setup of noise because I find that a little bit easier to have the noise move around my ball while I'm still developing. And then later we can come back in and splice in our mouse data. So I'll make a noise chop here. I'll go to the common page of parameters, turn on the time slicing so that instead of having lots of samples in a single channel, we actually just get one animated sample that we can use here. I'll then go over to the channel page of parameters. And right now we can see channel names. We only have chan one. So I'll delete that and actually enter TX, put a space and put TY, which is going to give us two distinct noise channels here. And this is a really good trick if you just need to generate a bunch of moving data just for your experiments. And the next thing we'll do after that is put a math chop to help scale the noise values here, because we can see them going from negative one to positive one. But if we actually look at our over, our ranges are going to be from about 0.5 to negative 0.5 on each side. So let's go ahead and create a math chop, go to the range page and set our from range, which we know our noise is negative one to one into our to range, which we said was negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. Now, the final thing we can do here is add a null chop after that and go ahead and reference these values on the TX and TY. And we've got ourselves a little bit of test data to work with. So now we can start to get into the feedback loop here. And this is something that's always tricky for a lot of newer developers, how to make the feedback loop, how to make it look good, how to create these trails but it's all relatively easy. Essentially what we want to do is create a feedback top, plug our source into it, and then cr finish creating a loop. You can almost imagine a full circle in your network here. So what I'll do is I'll create a composite top and essentially connect my over to that composite, connect the feedback to the composite, do something simple like an over setting here, and now to finish this feedback loop and really complete this circular cycle is go to my feedback top and tell it to feedback everything from my composite. And now you can see we have this kind of drawing that <laughs> is never going to disappear. So if that's kind of your intention, you can also do a lot of creative fun stuff with that. But we do want to have that trail fade away over time. So this is where a lot of the fun of feedback loops become is actually inserting different kinds of operators between the feedback and that composite. So the first thing I might do is actually add a level top here. And the level top, essentially what it's going to allow us to do is add a trail off to those trails so that they don't become permanent. An easy way we can do this is go to the post page and just slightly, ever so slightly turn down the opacity. 
So you could do something like 0 0.985. And now you can see immediately all those permanent trails kind of fade into the background. And now we have this nice long trail that long enough for it to be nice content, but not so long that it's gonna pollute the screen and just be so crazy. Now, another thing I really like adding inside of these feedback loops is a little bit of blur because what it's gonna do is essentially just make that trail so buttery smooth. And I like to add that directly after my feedback. So in between my feedback top and my level, I'm gonna go ahead and add a blur top. And I'm gonna zoom in to my output here as I start to turn up those different blur elements. And you can see it starts to get really nice and smooth, almost wispy, really. And as I start to turn up that pre-shrink even more, it's almost getting a little bit of that smoky kind of feel to it, which is really nice. Now, there are so many different ways that you can continue to build this, whether you want to do thresholding, edge detection. I mean, the sky is the limit with what you can do inside of here. But one extra trick that I'll leave you with is actually giving this a bit of outward motion. Now, if we want to do this, what we could do is in between our blur and our level is actually add a transform top. So I'll go ahead and add a transform here. And you're going to see something really interesting as we start to turn the scale up or down. And I always recommend just a tiny little bit goes a long way inside of a feedback loop. So for example, if I take my scale value in the transform top, which is set to one and one, and I just turn them up by 0.01, you can almost see it gives that feeling of everything kind of coming towards the screen and kind of dissipating. Now, the cool thing is you can also go in the opposite direction if you like. So for example, I could go to 0.99 and it feels like everything is going away from you and kind of being sucked into that center point. I'm going to go ahead and just turn this back to 0.01 because I think for this example, having it kind of wisp outward and towards the edges of the screen is a really nice effect. Now, this is kind of, you know, really simple. We've only added a few operators and you'll see with only two more operators to colorize this, we can get some really beautiful content. Now, when it comes to colorizing this kind of content, I always love using lookups, especially since our source material here ranges from black to white and is kind of monochrome with lots of gradients and different gray levels in between. So I'll go ahead and create a lookup top and I'll plug my composite into the first input. And for the second input, I'm gonna generate a ramp that's gonna be used for that lookup. So I'll create a ramp top here and plug that into the second input of the lookup. Now, so far nothing's happening because our ramp also goes from a black to white, just like our source content. But what I can do is start going and creating new color keys inside of my ramp. So let's say I want the farthest key to be red. And in this case, I was kind of going for a little bit of a heat map style of color texture. So what I can do is just start dropping more keys. And let's say if the first one is red, the second one will be an orange here. And what I'll do for the third key is maybe go towards a bit of a yellow or a green. I'll drop another key here that'll be even more green. And you can really see how cool and interesting this is making the actual content look, even if we're not done yet. Now, the fun part about this is how this lookup maps that black and white kind of monochrome range to this new color range that we have inside of our ramp. So I can continue to go further and further, giving it a bit more blue now, and then maybe even just a kind of dark blue that'll sit in the background as our final little color element here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a null top at the end of this. I'm gonna set the display flag so I can see it in the background. And there's two quick things that we're gonna to do to finish this example up here. One of them is that we can see that the red circle, the original source of our circle here is very visible. We can see that hard edge and it'll probably be easier if I slow down this noise a little bit. That while everything else in the scene is super smooth, we still have that hard edge of the original circle because it's getting overed on top of our feedback loop. Now there's lots of different ways you can deal with this and in some cases this might be preferable because then the user has a very clear idea of where their interaction is happening and everything else happens around it. But for something a little bit more ambient and ethereal, we maybe want to get rid of that. You could get rid of that by doing a different kind of composite mode, 
But one of the fun parts about these feedback loops is we can have the feedback loop happening and we can just pull out only the feedback element for our final composite. So instead of grabbing the composite tops output and plugging it into our lookup, we can actually just grab this final level before the circle gets composited back on top of it. So I'll grab my level, plug that into the first input of my lookup, and you can already see now we have that perfectly smooth gradient starting from that center red point and kind of going through oranges, yellows, greens, and blues. Now, which order it goes through those colors is totally up to the ramp that you create. So you can almost imagine the left side of it is going to be whatever is black in the original image is going to get that color. And it'll do all of the gradient all the way up to whatever is white is going to get that red. So for example, if in this case, I wanted more orange and less yellow, what I could do is move that yellow key over and give the orange key even more space inside of my ramp. And the more I do that, we'll see that there's less and less yellow and more and more orange in there. Now, the final thing we're gonna do here is connect up our mouse input. Because right now, it's kind of just running on some random noise, which could be great for some background content. But in this case, I'll go ahead and make a mouse in chop. And I always like setting this to be output coordinates of normalized which then is gonna give me a very similar functionality to my noise chop where from the left edge of the screen to the right edge of the screen is going to be from negative one to positive one. And similarly from the bottom edge of the screen to the top edge of the screen is also going to be negative one to positive one. Now, if you're starting to see those patterns and similarities, you're probably thinking, well, we can probably just take this noise chop and just replace the wire with our mouse. And you'd be right, because now we have a fully controllable dynamic interactive scene controlled by the mouse doing all sorts of pretty beautiful content. Now the final thing I've done in my example which I think is always nice is to give a little bit of dynamic attributes to your source. So in this case if maybe the user is moving a little bit slower or maybe you wanted to add a bit more variance we can actually change the size of the circle dynamically. So we could do this in so many different ways you could even make it interactive but one really easy thing we can do is actually use an LFO chop. So I'll create an LFO chop here and I'll turn this frequency way far down, maybe to about 0.1. Then what I can do is scale this value as well. So I'll put a math chop after it. And we can see this LFO is going also from positive one to negative one. So in my range parameters, I can say my from range is negative one to positive one. And then I can go check my circle and we can see right now 0.4 and 0.4 is our radius. And I think that's a good maximum size. So in my math, I can set my two range maximum to be 0.4. And maybe I can set my bottom range to be 0.1. So it's not going to be a huge difference, but just enough to give it a little bit of a fun pulsing feel. So after that, I'll go ahead and throw a null chop in here. And then I can go and reference that value on both of the radius parameters here. So now we can see we're gonna get a nice mix of big, thick kind of brush strokes happening, but then also it'll change and get a little bit skinnier and smaller and give us a little bit more precision over that kind of natural period of time. One final thing, I don't know, this is the last final thing, I swear. Uh, one other fun thing that you can do with this kind of content is actually purposefully inc include quantization. So right now you can see that everything is, is very smooth going from the different colors and the different ranges. And that's because our feedback we can see here is really a smooth blurred out image. But sometimes you might want to get an aesthetic that is more similar to maybe like a map topology where there are clear steps between all the colors. And this is really easy to do with some of the new tops that we have inside of Touch Designer. So for example, what I could do here is right click on the wire between my level and lookup, click insert operator, and find the limit top. Now the limit top functions very similarly to the limit chop if you've ever used it, but it's made for tops. And what we can do is go to the quantize page, turn on the quantization, and we'll set this to round. And now you can see it still has the same really cool effect, but it has almost this kind of layered and almost uh, topological map kind of look to it, which could be interesting for your different effects. So that's just another different way that you can get creative with this and have a lot of fun, but I hope this helps you out.
Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.